you're born today and you inherit all this stuff that everyone before you, all the domesticated animals, other people domesticated these animals thousands of years ago, <laughs> yeah. all the domesticated plants, all the roads which were built in England, starting with the Romans, yep. calculus, which was invented by Newton 500 years ago. It's yours for free. <laughs> all of this stuff, how to smelt iron, you know, all the knowledge about iron and fishing, how to fish hooks. I talk about fish hooks in the book, like the invention of fish hooks, the wheel, you go fire, you go on and on and on. All of this stuff, which was just given to you when you were born was accumulated by other humans across time. And, um, and it's this that makes us so powerful a species. Cause we have, if you think about it, rather pathetic bodies. Yeah. I mean, it's not our bodies that are, are making us powerful on this planet. It's our culture, our brains that are yep. making us powerful. I am joined by Yale professor, author, and incredibly wise human, Nicholas Christakis. <laughs> professor Christakis, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, uh, I'm very excited to sit down with you. I really enjoyed you on Joe Rogan about six weeks ago. Uh, fell in love with the content that you guys put out, and uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to speaking with you ever since. So what are we going to learn about today? Well, um, I think... The topic that I've been thinking about lately is human nature, and the part of human nature that interests me is not so much that part that we express within ourselves. So, for example, you know, you you could be spiritual within yourself, or you could be risk averse within yourself, or you could be uh, uh, you could have wanderlust within yourself. These are qualities that uh, human beings the world over might or might not express, and that have been shaped by our evolution and by natural selection. The parts that I'm interested in are the parts that, of our human nature that we express between ourselves. For example, do we love each other? Do we befriend each other? Do we cooperate with each other? Do we teach each other things? These are things that we also are naturally inclined to do. Um, and those are parts of our nature that we express between ourselves. And the reason I think these are important is that for too long, in my view, scientists and um, sort of people on the street, the uh, citizen, citizenry, have been overly concerned with what I would regard to be the dark side of our nature, our propensity to to, to violence and uh, tribalism and and lying and uh, you know um, selfishness. But the bright side, I think, has been denied the attention it deserves because equally we are prone to all those things I mentioned, to love and kindness and friendship and so forth. And in fact, I would argue that those forces were necessarily more powerful than the uh, than the evil forces. If, so, they, if they weren't, we wouldn't have made it very far. Yeah, well, that well, yes, but more to the point, we wouldn't be living socially. If every time I came near you, you killed me, <laughs> or, uh, or 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 gave me false, useless information, yeah. or took advantage of me in some way, I would be better off living as a solitary animal. So, so the, so it must be the case that the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs. Otherwise, we wouldn't be we wouldn't be living socially, um, and so. That's what I've been interested or thinking about lately. How and why? How and why did did our evolution not just shape the structure and function of our bodies? You know how our kidneys work, our pancreas works, not or our muscles work, not just shape the structure and function of our minds. You know how we think, uh, how we cope with adversity, uh, how we um, how we uh, you know how we uh, our personalities, for example, but how as well. Uh, shape the structure and function of our societies? H how did we come to live socially the way we do? Is it the case that the way we live, the societies we make, the world over, actually have been guided by our long evolutionary past? And, and I, the answer is yes. Thinking to a lot of the conversations that I've been having recently and a lot of the books that I lean towards, and I know that a lot of the audience will do as well, I certainly think that there is, uh, I'm discriminating towards the individual on those books, a lot of things to do uh -huh. with understanding our nature. Recently had Robert Greene on the laws of human nature. Recently had uh, and what qualities? What qualities did he emphasize about human nature? For example, oh wow! Um, so he talked about the fact that if you have brilliance in the world, you can be as talented as you want, but without the ability to understand others and communicate effectively, uh -huh. you will neutralize your brilliance and live a, a, a life filled with pain and misery. That was his synopsis. Ah. Uh, which okay. is, which, and again, so we've touched on two things. You've touched on the fact that it's important to talk about the social aspect, the group, not necessarily always just the individual. 
You've also mm-hmm. touched on the fact that talking in a positive light is something which appears to be lacking a little bit. And I would agree, I definitely agree on both counts. I think a lot about the fact that social media posts that anger people or agree with what they believe are the two most highly engaged posts on the internet. Presumably, Mm -hmm. that's going to lead to authors, and it will trickle either up or down, however you want to call it, to academics, to also think, well, if I want to write a book or have a paper or a study which is going to be uh, highly recognized and, and interesting at the moment, it would appear that trying to maybe focus towards the darker side of human nature, the things that are bad, the things that maybe anger people, etc. Maybe that's uh, a bias. I'm not sure whether you think that's the case. Well, I mean, okay, so, I mean, we have a number of biases. I mean, th- this attention to bad news is something which many people are thinking about. Like, why, if that's part of what you're talking about, is why do we, why do we focus on the nasty things that are around us so much? Part of the reason is that It is more advantageous to you to pay rapid attention to bad things, people theorize, than to pay rapid attention to good things. So, for example, in our ancestral environment, it would have been more beneficial to you to pay attention to the location of a fire or a flood or predators, for example, than to – which is all bad news – than to pay attention to the location of food, for example, which would be good news because one of them is going to kill you fast. And uh, the other one, you know, might take a while, the absence of good news, let's say. So, so this is one of the reasons that it is thought that we humans are wired to preferentially attend to bad news. And, you know, why, why media constantly, you know, f- feature stories of, you know, misery and destruction. and People click on it and read it. So um, anyway, so that's part of, I think, what, what is going on. But there was another part to your question. I, I lost track of the other part. So part of it is the anger and the leaning towards negativity, and the other part is the focus on the individual rather than the group. I think yes. we're in the meritocracy that we're in at the moment with the Gary V hustle and grind uh, culture that we have going says that your successes and failures are yours to hold on your own. And I think that that leads people to look inwards towards how can I make myself better yes. um, and not necessarily maybe think about the group. Yes, uh, I take your point. I mean, a lot of these qualities, we have to distinguish between those aspects of the point you just made that relate to, that are culturally specific, you know, that have to do with the society you were raised in, or that are individually specific, the kind of person you are, from those qualities that have been shaped by the long arc of our our uh, natural selection. And, um, and so, uh, I, I guess what I would say is, is that while it is the case that there's a lot in our nature that makes us pay attention to our individuality and how we act. In fact, I'm going to come back to this point in a moment. Uh, Much more interesting to me and much more relevant to our survival is our capacity to work together. But let let me say two things about this. First of all, this notion that we're individuals, which you take for, which many people take for granted, actually is kind of an interesting aspect of our species. So it is, if you think about it, every Every you know, we we humans are capable of being individuals, and not only are we conscious about it, but we we signal our unique identity, and we humans do that with our faces. So our faces, every human face is is different. While in principle, every pancreas should work the same, every face should not look the same. Every face should look different, and those regions of our genome that are responsible for the faces we're born with. Those regions are highly variable and highly recombinable in ways that explain, in large measure, the great variety of human faces. But not only do we signal our individual identity, not only do each of us have the capacity to say, this is me, not you, or not someone else, but each of us is capable of detecting other people's individuality. Our brain has regions that are devoted, a lot of energy and brain space is devoted to the ability to tell the difference between people. You can look out at a sea of a thousand people in a nightclub, for example, and you can tell each person is different who is who on the dance floor. And this is important. So you go and you dance with your own partner and not some random person <laughs> on, the, that would be, on the partner. That would be yeah. a bad idea. Yeah, and it would be awkward, and and you want to reciprocate, you know, like you know, this person kissed you, and now it's time to kiss them back, not a different person back, for example. <laughs> so, but to, but to do that, 
But to do that, you need to be able to tell who is who. And so this, all of this machinery, the face that signals identity, the brain power that detects identity, all of this is an evolutionary luxury. Other animals don't do this. We do this. And one of the deep paradoxes about living socially as a mammal is that first we must be individuals. This, the, there's a lot of uh, capacity that, uh, that, that we have that makes us capable of sig- being individuals and signaling our identity, which actually allows it the, uh, lies at the foundation of our ability to live socially. So, so for example, this relates to our ability to be friends. How, how can you have friends with other people unless you can track who is who? In order to have a sustained relationship with Tom and not Dick or Harry, you have to be able to reliably tell this is Tom, not Dick or Harry, and this is Tom yesterday, now this is still Tom. So, so this, this, this capacity to be individuals is very deeply connected to our capacity uh, to live socially. So um, now I forgot how I went off on this tangent. You asked I, me about- uh, I, wanted, I wanted to ask there, so you've touched on the fact that other animals don't do this. All uh, right. What do you mean don't do this and how so? Well, have you ever ever looked at a sea of penguins and or cows? I mean, I guess farmers can sometimes tell their cows apart, but you know, a cow is a cow. I mean, there's a herd of cattle, and is we that, don't have any sense. Is is that our interpretation of the cow, or is presumably the cows must be able to tell each other apart? Not as unique individuals, they can tell their offspring. So, for example, cows can tell this is my calf. I should mil- feed milk to this calf, not anyone else. But they don't tell, as far as we know, the difference between strange cows individually. Here are a hundred strange cows. Oh, but this is this strange cow and this is that strange cow. Uh. Elephants do it. Now we're not the we're not the only animal that does it, to be clear. Other social mammals do this. Uh, so we do it. We have this capacity for individuality. Uh, uh, certain other primates do it. Uh, elephants do it, both African and Asian elephants. Certain cetaceans do it. There's very interesting evidence from dolphins that dolphins have names. Uh, and that they, um, and that they, when they whistle to each other, they have a, a particular uh, whistling sound they make, which identifies themselves like a call sign. Like you might say, you know, Delta two one four, this is Tower, come in, <laughs> and 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 that means, you know, that's identified. That's how the dolphins repeatedly say, "I am speaking now. This is me." Yeah. And the other dolphins know, oh, you know, that's you know, that's Chris speaking, not Nicholas. They can tell the difference. Yeah. So. So, um, and now some birds can do it too, incidentally. There's some evidence that uh, certain uh, very social birds... Can ravens do it? Ravens are badasses. Yeah, ravens are very bad. I don't know about ravens and individuality. I'm sure it's known. I just don't know the answer. Ravens are crazy uh, clever, man. I, yes, I, I, I very, love very, very finding out about ravens and uh, uh, cephalopods. They're my two little yes. obsessions at yes. the moment. Yes, I think if you come back in... Uh, in um, 20 million years, I think ravens may be the ascendant species on the planet, and 100 million, it may be octopuses. Fantastic. Uh, I can't wait for the war between the ravens and the octopuses. No, they'll die out. We'll die out. Then the ravens will be ascendant. Then the ravens will die out. The octopuses will be underwater. Sweet. And then they will evolve. There's actually a lot of debate about whether in other planets, submarine animals could evolve into sophisticated civilizations because of the impossibility of having fire, fire underwater. Yes. So some people speculate, most people think this would not be possible that you have to be a terrestrial mammal, a terrestrial animal to have a civilization. But other people think that's just us being anthropomorphic, that in some alien planet, there could be um, very smart underwater creatures that, for example, develop the capacity to create air bubbles into which they put fire. Oh, wow. Or they have other other technologies we can't imagine that they manipulate the natural world in some way. So who knows? But anyway, uh, it'll be octopuses 100 million years. That's my prediction. You can come back and let me know if if it just didn't work out as I predicted. I got you. Um, have you ever read Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky? No, but I do talk about science fiction, utopias and dystopias in my book because uh, one of the things that I try to do is I try to imagine sort of counterfactual types of social order. So I look mm. at science fiction authors to see 
you know, what kind of what kind of crazy social worlds did they come up with? And to what extent did those resemble or not resemble our own? Yeah, I think if you've got if you've got room in the reading schedule over the coming months, I highly recommend Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky. Was uh, I think Pulitzer Prize Award or some some crazy <laughs> big prize award? Um, and in that future civilization of Earth creates a rapidly evolving amendment to the genome and then throws a bunch of monkeys primates onto a planet which is habitable and they've all got this particular amendment and the thinking is we will go to sleep for a long time and over a shorter period of time like a couple of million years they will go from being normal primates to these highly ascendant beings what happens is all of them this isn't this doesn't spoil the story thankfully all of the monkeys burn up on entry and it turns out that the only couple of species that are left to absorb this particular kind of genetic information are spiders and ants. And you see what <laughs> happens over a few million years and Adrian rolls the clock forward about how they all evolve. And one of the things really interesting that he touched on was when you have young planets, you don't have the mineralogy. Mineralogy? You don't have the yeah, minerals. Uh, yeah. Um, no, not mineralogy. It's... um. Uh, yeah, I, mean, uh, I, I can't remember the word right now. Go on. Yes, you don't have the right minerals. Yes. Um, yes. You don't have the right mineral makeup to be able to create uh, like smithing and stuff like that because it's just not <laughs> not existed for long enough to have those fossil fuels, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, um, so they create biological technology. It's absolutely fascinating. They make um, They make a computer, essentially a computer, out of um, – pheromone controlled ants linked together in a hive oh it's, yes, it's yes. really really cool but i mean getting out of the realm of science fiction and back to the back to the real world um i totally get what you mean the the fact that we are a social species the fact that we can tell each other apart it shows that there has to be a degree of collaboration and also a lot of what we've been learning about recently listeners will remember uh, William von Hippel's episode which is fascinating talking about pair bonding talking about the fact that you have to spend a lot of time with the partner to protect the child um, all of this I guess lends credence to the fact that we're an incredibly social species yeah I talk about pair bonding and one of the things that many people take for granted is that you know we could be a species that just had sex with each other but we don't just have sex with each other. We are attached to each other. We tend to be attached to our partners. This is very rare uh, in the um, mam mammals. It's common in birds, actually, which is another interesting thing again. But um, in mammals, uh, you can have a one-off kind of reproductive interaction, and you don't stay together in a kind of monogamous way for a sustained period of time and multiple uh, you know, offspring being produced by the same union. But we do do that. And in humans, that sense of attachment is expressed or felt as love, that we love our partners. And there's interesting ideas as to why we do that. You already alluded to one of them. One has to do that if you have love between partners, you can have more successful, a uh, higher number of surviving offspring. So the, uh, so the male will stick around to help invest in the young, but, um, but he will only do that if he can be – this is the theory – if, uh, if he can be confident that those are his offspring, not another man's offspring. And one of the ways that women will signal that to the male, the females will signal the female, male, is by, uh, by, love, by expressing love for them in a way. So, and uh, anyway, so there, there's, there's some interesting ideas about the evolution of pair bonding, why, why we have this, this, this phenomenon that is all around us, that if you stop and think about it, is unnecessary. We could be a sexually reproducing species without having an emotional attachment. And yet we do feel this attachment. And the reason is why it's part of our nature. Um, what purpose does it serve? And one of the purposes is what you alluded to it. It's felt to enhance a uh, reproductive uh, fitness. Yeah. Um, so why are we, and I should say in the book, I talk about this sense of attachment is seen of course in homosexual unions. It's seen in polyandry, which are of course not reproductive unions. It's seen in polyandry it's seen in polygyny. It's seen in monogamous uh, cultures. So the important thing that's very constant the world over is not how we pick. It's, it's seen in arranged marriages. So, so even though love is seen as a dangerous phenomenon in countries that have arranged marriages, it's dangerous before marriage. 
even in countries with arranged marriages, love is seen as a very much to desired outcome of marriage. Yeah. So, so it's seen as a desirable and normal property to love your mate. And if you measure uh, using some various psychometric scales, sort of uh, com- the, the sort of the passionate love scale is one of them. Uh, of partners, you looking at arranged and, and uh, marriages and, and non-arranged or so-called love matches, within a few years of marriage, there's no difference. In fact, there's evidence that the divorce rate, more than a little evidence, that the divorce rate, of course, it's complicated to know why, but the divorce rate is also lower in arranged marriages. So anyway, no matter what the marital system, and there are many all over the world, one of the universals is that people love their partners, which is beautiful, actually, if you think about it. I mean, one of my arguments is that these qualities that are universal also are good. Um, and and in fact, that's one of the reasons they're universal is that they they were fitness enhancing. They made our world better for us. I recently did a podcast with uh, Caleb Jones, who is a very big non-monogamy advocate. And that I yes. found that incredibly interesting to hear his point of view and the listeners will at home. I don't want to delve too deeply into that, but I'm thinking an awful lot about what it is that he was talking about. And he also alluded to the uh, the divorce rate, the increasingly uh, rapidly increasing. Well, there increasing. are some... There's some people, I mean, just as a, as a, as a sort of a, a, a moral matter, I have no issues with polyamory. And, um, uh, and I, I don't think, um, and there's certainly some people who, who find that very appealing. And I think that's totally fine. I mean, they can find each other and they're adults and they can do in you know, a free society what they want. But there is no, to my knowledge, no successful society or even commune that has endured long. And I discuss this in the book that's been organized, organized around polyamory. Um, it's, it's a very unstable, uh, arrangement for, uh, a large group of people. It's not necessarily unstable for couples. I know many cup, not many, I know a couple of couples that practice polyamory among themselves, mm-hmm. but I don't, I don't know of any society that's organized that way, or even any commune that has survived more than one or two generations organized around polyamory. Interesting. Many have tried. Do you yeah. know the reason? Do you know the, <laughs> do you know the reason? It's very interesting actually. So um, so if you think about the establishment of utopian sects or communes, they have a problem, which is that they want the group members to have allegiance to the whole community. To the, you're supposed to feel a member of the whole community. Mm-hmm. And, and this is why, for example, in many communes, not all, and also in certain totalitarian states, the, the family unit is a threat to the loyalty that the individuals, the allegiance they feel – to the state mm-hmm. or to the mm-hmm. commune. So mm-hmm. they try to break down the family. Kibbutzes in Israel tried to do this also, by the way, sort of break down the family unit. Also, they try to break down friendships. For example, in East Germany, everyone was, you, you couldn't have friends you were because you, they could be, you know, Stasi agents. Everyone was ratting on everyone else. So this type of, so this type of breaking down intimate connections or friendly connections between people is is often seen as an as as necessary in order to foster allegiance to the total group the totality very orwellian yes yes but here's it is but here's the thing about uh sexuality and uh, love of partners so some communes address the problem that humans naturally love their partners and wish to be in love and wish to be loved. This is a very natural thing that most people feel and all societies manifest. Um, this could be seen as a threat to the, to the maintenance of kind of social cohesion for these utopian sects or, 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 uh, or for example, we're talking about now, but they have adopted very different practices to address that. Some sects have tried to adopt polyamory so they say everyone can – there's no – we don't want any sexual jealousy. Everyone can have sex with everyone else. Brave new world. Yes. <laughs> so uh, – so, but again, for the reasons we just discussed, ironically, others gone to the opposite extreme. Nobody can have sex with anyone else, a totally celibate. But both of those extremes are serving the same purpose. If you think about it, both those sects that want you to have sex with everybody and those sects – that wants you to have sex with nobody, in both of those cases, they're trying to break down a kind of intimate connection to particular people. They're trying to anonymize or, or atomize the experience. So, so the paradox is that in communes, you, these very opposite practices actually are in the service of the same end, mm. which is to foster allegiance to the group. The Shakers, for example, famously prohibited sex, which of course makes it very difficult to... <laughs> sustain the community it can't be produced but uh 
But anyway, I'm sorry, there's a digression within a digression. Oh, I get it, I get it. It's, it's, I mean, you've touched on a point that I wanted to go to there, which is the fact that humans naturally seek some sort of companionship. And by removing the ability to, to go deep with either some people or anyone, like either yes. everyone, everyone or anyone, you force people to look for this connection elsewhere and that's where the state comes in so is the reason that humans are yeah, but the state the state can't take the place you see one of the things that's also true is that in our ancestral environment being alone was deadly so we for reasons i discuss in the book we ex- I explore the origins of friendship and some theory as to why we develop the capacity to have, why we live groups, all of this stuff, which has to do with coping with the dangers in the environment. Uh, so, uh, so, so feeling, we, we evolved this kind of sense that uh, being alone uh, could be dangerous and risky, and we crave intimate friendships that we can all, every human being that is listening to this, almost everyone, knows what I'm talking about when I say you have an intimate friendship, someone you trust and you you talk to them and uh, and you have a sense that they know you as a person and they value you as special and unique. You're irreplaceable to them. Each of us is totally replaceable to strangers, but we are irreplaceable to our friends, right? We are unique individuals and that friendship is special. So so this this all this apparatus that we have, all these emotions and sensibilities and behaviors that sustain friendship, in the modern environment where you're interacting with people anonymously or where you go to bureaucracies and you interact with bureaucrats. So now instead of interacting with people face-to-face as individual people, you interact with them as replaceable cogs in a system. They're just, you know, it's the person at the Department of Motor Vehicles who's you're interacting with and they're doing their job. And uh, we all sense that as awful. And, uh, and the reason we sense it as awful is because on some level we recognize these are not our evolved psychology is saying, "Warning, warning, warning! These aren't your real friends. You know, these are <laughs> these are these are not real relationships." And so we sense that kind of anomie. And this is why, incidentally, I also think that a lot of online interactions make people so miserable because our evolved psychology wants real, intimate, face-to-face, deep, sustained social relationships. And instead, what we get is, you know, acquaintances. And uh, and and that's immiserating, I think. So anyway, so it's kind of all of this stuff is is connected, actually. Absolutely, it's interesting that you touch on um, the online connections because you know it's a trope to say we're more connected than ever whilst feeling more alone, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, yes. all that sort of stuff. Um, that's correct. Do you think it is there's something specific about the face to face interaction about the fact that um, the I think it's more than half of communication cues are nonverbal and a WhatsApp chat doesn't quite fulfill that need. Yes. I mean, for example, in promoting the book or supporting the book, I've done a whole bunch of interviews and I've noticed that quite a few of the, like you, quite a few of the more sophisticated podcasters, even if there's going to be an audio only file, mm-hmm. they want to do video. That's in fact, I asked you at the beginning, I said, are you yep. going to you're gonna, you, we're going to use video. Are you going to record the video? Or yes. you just we're just seeing each other? Well, why is that? It's because the conversation is more natural, more fluid. I can see. Are you laughing at my joke or not? Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I can see you're getting bored by what I'm saying, and I should move on. Never. You never. know, all of those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all of those things. You know. So, um, you know, those are fundamental parts of how we communicate. Got you. So, going back to the real beginning, the evolutionary. Um, uh, I guess prerogative for why we are a social species. Is it simply that a human on its own is a human that's dead and our main uh, advantage as evolving humans was that we could coordinate well as a group? Does that appear there to be? Many, a- there, are many, there are many things that have made us one of the most ascendant species on the earth. Humans, I think, have the broadest or one of the broad. The, Humans have the broadest. I think ants also have an equally broad, but it's side. Set that aside for a moment. Yep. One of the broadest geographic ranges of any animal species. So everyone knows that some animals live in some places, but not in other places. Yeah. But there's no place humans don't live. We live mm-hmm. all over the world, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from the Arctic to the equator, in deserts, in in snow-covered plains. We live everywhere, and the reason we do that is not because of our 
our bodies. We haven't adapted physically, although we have also in some cases done adapted physically. Yep. It's because of our culture. It's because of what we can teach each other. It's because of our ability to accumulate knowledge. So slowly over generations, people invent kayaks or they invent parkas or slowly over generations, people invent technologies to, uh, to find water in the desert. And, uh, and because of those innovations, we are able to, uh, to transmit that knowledge from person to person. And so in order to survive, we have to be part of a community that has this type of knowledge. A teenager, we, we do a lot of work with a Hadza. Well, actually, we don't anymore, but we used to, which is a, one of the last uh, forager groups on the planet. They live around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania. There are only about a thousand of them left. These people hunt and gather for their food, just like every human did until about 10,000 years ago. Just to interject, uh, what um, period of history do they align with? The Hadza are still alive. No, no, what, Hadza, what, what would they be representative of in our past? Uh, uh, the way we lived until about before the agricultural revolution, till about 10,000 years ago. Wow. So the Hadza, the Hadza hunt and gather for their food. They have no material possessions to speak of. They sleep out under the stars. Uh, and, um, and they live in this environment in, in, in Tanzania, around Lake Ayasi. And, um, and if, if I drop you there, or me there, we would we would be killed in an environment. We would die in an environment that a Hadza, you know, seven year old could survive. Flourishes in. in, yeah. Yes, yes, and it's not because of the differences in our bodies. It's because we have none of the knowledge, and so the knowledge is, of course, transmitted socially. It lives. The knowledge lives in the interstices between people. That's where the knowledge lives and survives across time. Then it comes into my brain. And then it goes into your brain and so forth. So it spreads across these connections, this knowledge, and is produced by groups of people, this, this knowledge. And so this is what it makes it possible is for us to survive uh, this, this, this living socially. I think one of my favorite quotes from Warren Buffett is that compounding interest is the uh, yes. eighth, eighth wonder of the world. And it's occurring, as we see in front of us, with knowledge, right? I can put my hand, yes. in, a, I can put my hand in a fire burn my hand, and then tell you, and you know not to put your hand in a fire without having to go through it. That fact alone, Correct. accumulating over however many generations, yes. leads to me and you talking over Skype. Correct. <laughs> and in fact, in fact you, could take, you, could take, you could take the average British uh, you know, uh, high school student that uh, studied calculus, let's say, in, uh, when they were 17, and if you move them back 500 years, they'd be the smartest mathematician on the planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, you know, this, the, 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 and, and, and we get calculus, which, you know, Isaac Newton and, and Leibniz invented. Actually, just as an aside, we learn calculus. We are taught calculus at the speed at which Newton invented it. It's, <laughs> a, it's astonishing. Isaac Newton <laughs> takes a year to invent calculus. I mean, it's just, the man is just unbelievable. Force of nature. Ah, anyway, so, and now, but the point is, you're born today and you inherit all this stuff that everyone before you, all the domesticated animals, other people domesticated these animals thousands of years ago, <laughs> yeah. uh, all the domesticated plants, all the roads which were built in England, starting with the Romans, yep. calculus, which was invented by Newton 500 years ago. It's yours for free. <laughs> all of this stuff, how to smelt iron, you know, all the knowledge about iron and fishing, how to – fish hooks. I talk about fish hooks in the book, like the invention of fish hooks, the wheel, you go fire, you go on and on and on. All of this stuff, which was just given to you when you were born, was accumulated by other humans across time. And um, and it's this that makes us so powerful a species because we have, if you think about it, rather pathetic bodies. I mean, there are very few animals our size. I don't think there's any animal our size that we could take in a one-on-one -on -one battle. Uh, I mean, we'd, we'd, you're probably I mean, about I mean, even a, a, a doe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A doe would kill. Us. Yeah, you're probably I about mean, the same weight and biomass as maybe like a cheetah or something like that. Well, we died of a cheetah. I mean, look, I can't even think. Very what is dead. an animal that's about the size that we could kill? Penguin? Penguin's not our size. I mean, obviously, tiny animals, we, you can kick a penguin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, you know, I mean, any tiny insects you could kill. I mean, they could kill us, too. They're poisonous spiders and everything else. But my point is, yep. we, are, we have pathetic bodies. Yep. I mean, it's not our bodies that are, are making us 
powerful on this planet. It's our culture, our brains that are yeah. making us powerful. I've got I've got one of the most important questions to ask you right now, uh, Professor huh? Christakis, and it's: Would you rather fight one horse-sized duck or twenty duck-sized horses? Twenty duck-sized horses. What's what's your strategy going to be? You kick and kick one and move, kick and move, kick yep. and move. You got know, you. It, yeah, and, and I mean, you actually you move to the place where you fell the first opponent. Got you, and you pile these bodies so, up yeah. like three hundred. Well, you said twenty, like in, like in three hundred, the movie. Ah, right. Yeah, yes. And you just got mounds of mounds of these dead duck-sized horses everywhere. Well, cool. I think so. I asked one of the fittest men on the planet, Dan Bailey, this question as well, and he gave the exact same answer. So you are you're on a level with elite athletes <laughs> with regards to your answer. <laughs> well, I I spent years I spent years training in the martial arts, but that's another story. Practicing duck-sized horse kicking. Uh, <laughs> no, practicing. to get your black belt, they put you in a ring with four guys and uh, and um, you have to learn how to fight against multiple opponents. And, uh, you know, it's not easy. It's for various reasons. Anyway, there are basic techniques you can use. So if, I, if, I, if this situation occurs, I'm going to call on you. So um, no, no, I'm <laughs> way, way call Joe Rogan instead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll, kick them in, he'll, he'll, he'll kick them into the next week, won't he? Yeah. Um, so we've talked yes. about we've, we've talked about kind of our. Uh, evolutionary past moving into where we are now did you reflect in the book on what uh, what the advantages and disadvantages of modern society are doing to our desire for social cohesion um yes and no i mean i'm interested in i'm interested in the long arc of our prehistorical past you know so we've evolved over hundreds of thousands of years and it's only in the last 10,000 years that we've even had history at all, that we've had historical or political or cultural uh, – well, not c- cultural. We've had a long time, but specific kinds of cultural forces acting on us. Um, so I'm interested in the ways in which our capacity for social interaction and, and, and living, toge- living together were shaped at a time that preceded the invention of cities or – the invention of the internet or anything like that. Now, these cultural products, the cities and internet and everything else, are also shaping our evolutionary trajectory, but that's not the main driver of the way we live socially uh, today. For example, my uh, Greek grandmother was born in a, in a, in a little village in, uh, in southern Greece, and um, if she's not alive anymore. She was born over 100 years ago. But if you, you, could, if you had asked her when she was alive what um, – you know, when she was a 10 year old girl, how many friends did she have? And she would have said, I have one or two best friends and there are four or five of us girls. We hang out together in this little village in Southern Greece, you know, a hundred years ago. And if you could ask my daughter, Lena, who's now 21, but back, let's say when she was 10, you know, 10 years ago, you ask her the same question and she has an iPhone in her pocket. She would give you the same answer. Yeah. So it's something deep and fundamental about our nature about this desire for one or two best friends, most people, not everyone, about about uh, 90%, 92% of people in developed countries have uh, one, at least one best friend or one intimate, very intimate social contact. 8% That's of people, 8% have no one, which is very sad. Some of these people are elderly widowers, their spouse has died, everyone they know has died. Yeah. Others of them, others of them have other sort of, um, uh, disabilities that make it difficult for them. But anyway, so most people have the sense of they have one or two best friends and they're four or five of, uh, you know, your intimate friends that you hang out with. And Got then you. they're broader circles. The point is the technology didn't change that, right? I mean, Chris, this is a cultural constant. In fact, we've done this. We've looked around the world in my laboratory. We've mapped networks in, in, uh, in Uganda and in, in, in Tanzania and in, in, in India and in Honduras and in the United States and wherever you go, you find the same thing. People organize themselves in the same way. So it's not to do with the technology. Does that specifically maximize fitness, do you think, or did it over the years, like the likelihood of survival? Yes. Yes. I think that the specific mathematical structure of the social networks that we make, and we've done some other evidence on this using a variety of tools from genomics and also some actual anthropological tools, uh, the, the, the mathematical structure of networks that we make, I believe, 
have been shaped by natural selection. How so? And um, we, okay, well, this is a little hard to explain, so it's a bit of a tangent. But let's do you want it. Me to- We've got it. We've got it. Okay. The listeners, the listeners are rubbing their hands together. They're ready to go. Come on. Okay, so here we go. So um, there's a very fundamental property about human social networks, which is that we have this thing called degree assortativity. Degree is the number of connections that each person has. So it's it's how many friends you have. You have you have a degree five. You've got five friends. I have degree ten. I've got ten friends. Someone else has degree two. They've got two friends. And degree assortativity means people with similar numbers of friends are preferentially connected. So popular people befriend popular people, and unpopular people befriend unpopular people. Okay. Mm-hmm. This property of degree assortativity is the opposite of a property known as degree disassortativity which is the way the airport network is organized. So unlike human social networks, which have degree of sortativity, popular people are connected to popular people and unpopular people are connected to unpopular people, in the airport network, it's the opposite, right? We have a hub and spoke system. So the unpopular airports with few connections aren't connected to other small airports with few connections. They're all connected to London and Gatwick and Chicago and Denver. Yes. And if you want to get from one place to another place in an airport network, you've got to go from... Uh, you know, New Haven, Connecticut, to Chicago. And then from Chicago, you can go anywhere. Yeah. Right? You can fly to any city. So in two hops, you get there because the network is organized in this degree disassortative way. Yes. Okay. Now, if you think about it, in which of those two kinds of networks, if an, if an epidemic, if you infected a random person in, in these two networks, a degree assortative and a degree disassortative network, in which of those two kinds of networks would you get a bigger epidemic? Ah, uh, yes. You should, have the, you should have the intuition that you'll get a bigger epidemic in the degree disassortative network because in the degree disassortative network, the first person that gets infected, the next step, they are, uh, they are connected to the most popular person and then that person spreads it to everybody. So, so in a degree disassortative network, epidemics will spread very rapidly. Whereas in a degree assortative network, like humans make, epidemics can be contained within one part of the network. So one unpopular person gets an infection, and they infect their unpopular friends, and they are all infected over there. Yeah. The rest of us are okay, yeah. because they're not connected to the popular person, let's say. The story is more complicated than this, but this is the gist. So... What's very interesting to me is that of all the kinds of ways that we could form social networks, we form them to have this property of resistance to epidemics because we form a degree of sortative networks. And amazingly, elephants do the same thing. This is discussed in the book. And so do whales. So do orcas. And so other social mammals, when they go about making their friendship networks, even though our last common ancestor with those with elephants was 85 million years ago. They independently have converged on the same way of social socially organizing themselves that gives them this sort of epidemic resistance property at the population level. That's so, so fascinating. Are, so yeah, so these are some ideas about you know uh, in response to what you asked. That's really fascinating. I'd- it makes complete sense. Um, yeah. I, I, I totally understand. I think um, one of the things that's come to mind, Dunbar's number, which is yeah. the supposed upper limit, upper bound that a human can have in terms of friends. Did you look at that? And I've never delved into this. Is, there, is that like a gospel or is there some, uh, some criticism of that? Yeah, so Robin Dunbar is a very famous uh, physical anthropologist at Maudlin College at Oxford. He um, he uh, is well known for this finding, which is is a correct finding, uh, which is that uh, human beings. It's not the upper limit. It's that on average, our capacity to uh, track social relationships is at about 150. And he made this prediction based on a comparative analysis of different primate species and the size of their groups. And there's been abundant evidence sort of confirming his ideas in this regard. And the notion is that is that you are able to, our brains are endowed with the ability to, and and he uses as a kind of approximation of what he means by knowing someone is, knowing someone is if you can pick up your conversation where you left off, where you left it off before. 
Uh So you remember enough of who they are and what kinds of things you're discussing so that if you meet them again after an absence, you can pick up the conversation. And so the number of people we can do this with is about 150. We uh, we, We can know if these people are friends or enemies. We can also know something about the relationships of all the pairs of people. So you know, if you have 100 friends, you know, does this person like that person or not get along? And for example, many of the listeners will have this experience. Some listeners will have gone to high schools that had small, I know the word is different in English, in British English and American English. So when I say class, I mean yep. the group of people that are in, you know, your year, your year. Yeah. Exactly. So there might be in, in, in your school, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a private school and there are a small year of, let's say a hundred students. Yep. If you went to such a school, you know that you knew every other student and you knew something about the relationships of every other student. And if you contrast that, for example, with a um, with a municipal school that's run by the state, which is bigger, and there might be a thousand people in your year or 500 people in your year, you know you didn't know all those thousand people uh, and you didn't know the relationships of all those people. And that's a limitation of your of your brain, of our brains. So um, so this is what Robin Dunbar's uh, – arguments are about do you think that that was maximizing evolutionary fitness as well i do remember when i spoke to i think in our ancestral environment we didn't need to brains that could track larger numbers of people because there weren't bigger groups Uh i see apparently i was again uh, william von hippel is the closest um uh, podcast that i've done to what we're discussing at the moment i think he alluded to the fact or at least posited that groups over he said around about 50 he thought would tend to disband. He thought that groups, at least when we're talking uh, Australopithecus, that kind of uh-huh. era, that those groups would disband into groups of 50 because the larger groups end up being, I think it was, I, I, I can't remember the reason why, but he, I think he thought that was the case. Uh, yes, and, and he may be right. I don't know the answer to that question. There's a, there's a lot of... Um, suggestive evidence about the group sizes of ancestral hominids. Um, we can certainly study living primates and do comparisons, and that's what, what Robin Dunbar did for his um, analysis. Mm-hmm. I got you. So moving forward, as we as we go on, obviously you have looked at the past. Do you have any predictions about the future? Do you have any sort of suggestions for the future? For- well, I mean, one kind of speculative set of ideas that interests me right now is um, – what I call hybrid systems of humans and machines. So increasingly, you know, the, the relationship between human beings and technology is an ancient topic. You know, Homer talks about this in the Iliad. You know, what's the role of bronze spears in warfare? You know, we invent a new, a new technology, and it has, uh, you know, certain um, implications. For example, uh, or, or you know, Odysseus uses the Trojan horse to get into the city. You know, that's a technology. Um, and, and, uh, you know, you had the Luddites, you know, breaking the, the looms, you know, in England. And so there's lots of, you know, our relationship technology is complicated and longstanding, but what's different now is that we are beginning to endow these machines with uh, a kind of volition of their own. I mean, they're, they're not obviously human. They don't really have their own desires, but they're able to act independently and they're living amongst us. So we have digital assistants like Alexa, for example, or we have autonomous vehicles on the car, on the road. So you're driving down the road and they're mostly human drivers, but there are also some autonomous vehicles that are driving down the road and doing their thing. Um, or online, you know, we, you have your Twitter friends and, you know, I'm on Twitter and some of the people that follow me, I think, are bots, you know, and so there they are. They're in the system. They're humans and some bots that are interacting. I call this a hybrid system because it's hybrid between humans and machines. But what's interesting to me is not the interactions between a human and a machine. It's the ways in which the presence of those machines acting as if they were human modifies how we interact with each other. Let me give you an example. So you add, bring an Alexa into your home and the people who design the Alexa make it want to make it very obedient. They're not interested in you having to do, you could just say, you know, uh, you know, play Little Richard, you know, or play Beethoven, and the machine does what you ask, or you know, order milk. Um, it does. You don't have to say please. Could you order some milk? Or would you please, you know, do this or whatever? You, you don't have to be polite to the machine. Yeah. So, but think about how the addition of this machine into a home might train a child to be rude, 
And it's not a problem if the child is rude to the Alexa, but then the child goes to the schoolyard and is rude to his or her friends. Mm. And so now we have a rude group of children that has arisen because of the introduction of this machine into the social system. Or you think about driverless cars. In a world in which we have only human drivers, they're all human. And eventually we'll have a world in which there are only autonomous vehicles. None of us will drive cars anymore. You'll go to racetracks to drive cars. That's like 30 years from now, if not sooner. So, uh, And those cars will be, will be Bluetooth enabled and they will communicate with each other and they'll move in a kind of laminar flow down the highway or they'll entrain with each other and they'll be fine. There'll be no collisions. It'll be all fine. But between now and then, we're going to have a hybrid system of humans and machines. And the question is, how should we program those autonomous vehicles so that as they move among us, they improve rather than degrade our behavior? So, for example, the car maker might want to design the car to move very smoothly so that the occupant of the autonomous vehicle has a nice, pleasant ride. But now the human drivers behind this vehicle might be lulled into a false sense of security and become inattentive. And so when they veer off to go and go to the part of the highway that has just human vehicles, these inattentive drivers might cause more collisions. Mm. Now, the person who bought the vehicle, the autonomous vehicle, and the designer of the autonomous vehicle doesn't care at all about those people <laughs> who are, you know, killing themselves over there because of the new bad driving practices. But we should care. So, so one of the things I'm concerned about is the ways in which these new technologies in the future are going to reshape our social interactions are going to modify how we live together and might potentially threaten some of these fundamentally good qualities about how we have evolved to live together that you and I have been talking about. Moving on, where can the listeners find you online if they want to find out a little bit more? Uh, well, my laboratory is uh, www.humannaturelab.net. And um, of course, we've been talking about my book, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origin of a Good Society, which is available everywhere. Uh, and on my lab, we have videos and paper, scientific papers and all kinds of other information. People want to delve deep. It will be in the show notes below, along with the links to Blueprint and your Twitter. Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter, of course. You are incredibly interesting on Twitter. I'm looking forward to reading through some of your stuff. I've got to save for this evening. Uh, Professor Christakis, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having very much, Chris. I'm very grateful.